The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Just a few last remarks. Last day we were uh, intensively looking at the structure and properties of oxide glasses, and I just have a few remarks left to make about that, and then we'll move on to kinetics today. Um, just a reminder, uh, we saw that uh, oxide glasses typically consist of three types of uh, components, uh, primarily network formers. These are covalent oxides that form oxygen bridges between the metal uh, species. And we can tailor the nature of the network by adding so-called modifiers, which are ionic oxides, and they donate oxide ions. The oxide ions go into the network and they break the oxygen bonds uh, in a process we call scission. And then uh, lastly, in certain glasses, we add a compound of a type called an intermediate. And these are actually network formers, but they form uh, a different number of bonds than the parent network, typically a larger number of bonds. And in doing so, they create some free volume, which enhances certain properties, sometimes the mechanical properties, sometimes the uh, um, thermal properties, specifically uh, thermal shock resistance is enhanced by the addition of network formers. And at the end of the lecture, we started talking about strengthening mechanisms. And the, the way to strengthen oxide glasses, remember, oxide glasses are not too bad in compression, but they're very weak in tension. And the way to strengthen them is to pre-stress compressively so that the effective yield stress becomes then the sum of the natural yield stress of the material plus the compressive stress that you've added to the material. And you don't have to necessarily do this through the entire material. Typically, we simply uh, pre-stress the surface because, let's face it, if something's going to fail, it's going to fail through the application of force causing the crack at the free surface. If we can prevent the crack from forming at the, at the free surface, this can, in many instances, uh, preserve the uh, integrity of the object. So we saw the first way of improving the strength of uh, an oxide glass called tempering, and that exploits uh, differential cooling so that if you look on this trace here, the volume versus t uh, temperature, we know that if we have surface cooling at a high rate, we'll have a higher excess volume than if we have uh, cooling in the bulk of the glass at a lower rate, and that leads to a differential in volume, which ultimately uh, has a compressive stress on the surface. There's another way to achieve the same uh, goal, that is, compressive stress on the surface, and that involves a chemical treatment. And in, in particular, uh, what we can do is take the, take the glass, and I'm going to give a, a representative composition here. Let's say we have a glass that consists of, we'll have a network former, uh, silica, and a network modifier will be soda, sodium oxide, and we'll throw in an intermediate, alumina. So this is a sodium aluminosilicate glass. Former, modifier, intermediate. And we know that the sodium ions are present. The oxide ions have gone into the network and have resulted in the formation of terminal oxygens here. So the sodiums are still free as sodium ions. So let's take a look at the sodium ions at the surface of the glass. Some of the surface sites are going to be occupied by sodium ions. What we can do is we can immerse this glass into a molten salt, a molten salt at elevated temperature. So typically, let's look at something like potassium chloride. And this melts at 775 centigrade. So this might be sitting at 800 degrees C. And as a molten salt, it consists of potassium cations and chloride anions. Now take a look at this interface here. On the left, I have a high concentration of sodium, but no sodium in the molten salt. In the molten salt, I have a high concentration of potassium, but no potassium in the glass. By virtue of the concentration gradient, potassium will want to enter the lattice and displace some of the sodium, and some of the sodium will want to leave to enter the salt. Ions are soluble in an ionic medium. So what happens if a potassium ion enters the, the glass and occupies a site previously held by 
sodium. Well, we know that the radius of the potassium ion is substantially larger than the radius of the sodium ion. So if potassium enters the glass, it's going to be a force fit. This means force fit. And it's going to lead to the generation of compressive stresses. Compressive stress. And this is not too different from what happens when we put carbon into iron. The carbon is larger than the interstitial site in iron. So this treatment is called uh, ion exchange. Ion exchange. So by ion exchange, which is a chemical treatment, we can also strengthen the glass and thereby make it a little more robust for, uh, for use. So I think that's a good place to, to stop the treatment of of glasses and uh, may return a little bit later in the semester. So what I want to do now is uh, start a, a new unit and the unit I want to talk about today is a unit that would be called from the domain of physical chemistry I want to talk about kinetics, about chemical kinetics. And chemical kinetics is the study of reaction rates and mechanisms. Reaction rates and mechanisms. And this is very important for a number of reasons. And uh, so for that, we discuss it in 3091. Let's talk about three reasons that come to mind. First of all, productivity. Productivity. If we go into an industrial setting and we want to improve throughput or yield, we need to understand the rates and mechanisms of reactions. All right? So this is linked to competitiveness. It's linked to resource utilization, efficient use of materials and energy. We know how to process things effectively. The second thing is environment. A number of you have come to me after class and on different occasions spoken of your interests in environmental matters. Well, one of the simplest things one can do to minimize adverse environmental impact of chemical processes is to be efficient. So understanding how reactions proceed is critical in minimizing the adverse environmental impact. So productivity issues, secondly, environmental issues, and thirdly, societal issues, societal issues, ultimately. You know, you're here at MIT, you want to get a, an analytical education, and you want to go out and do something in the world, and one of the things that can happen if you understand your chemistry and understand the kinetics is you can keep a plant operative, you can keep people working. So there are societal implications for failure to understand kinetics. When a process becomes obsolete, you go out of business and people go out of work. So for these and many other reasons, we want to study kinetics. And uh, kinetics takes place over a very wide range. That's why I played this song about time. That's what this is about, it's about time. We have at the one extreme very slow chemical processes and at the other extreme very fast chemical processes. Slow, we have things that take place along geological or even cosmic time scales. Very, very slow processes. And on the other extreme, we have such things as explosions. Explosions. And explosions aren't necessarily destructive. For example, in the airbag that operates in an automobile, it operates thanks to the fast kinetics of a gas-solid reaction. There is no pump. There is no pump that can inflate an airbag at an acceptably high rate to do you any good in an automobile crash. What happens here is the kinetics of a reaction between two solids. What we have is basically solid plus solid goes to gas. And as you know, the volume of a gas is thousands of times the volume of a solid. And in particular, it's the reaction of sodium azide with potassium nitrate. And one of the products is nitrogen gas in huge quantities. So you have your accelerometer. The accelerometer decides that you're decelerating at a rate that's alarmingly high. It's probably not a healthy occasion. A tiny current, a tiny current, electric current flows through a wire, which acts as the trigger for this reaction once the reaction goes you can inflate the airbag in a matter of milliseconds. So what we want to do is understand some of the basics of, of chemical kinetics. And so let's start 
and we're going to look at a, a general reaction, a general reaction and understand how, first of all, to characterize chemical reactions. Let's characterize the rate of a chemical reaction. So I'm going to write A, little a is the uh, stoichiometry and big A is some chemical identity. So A moles of A plus B moles of B react to form little c moles of C plus little d moles of D. So that's sort of a, a uh, prototypical reaction. And kinetics, the kinetics accounts for the, the rate of conversion. The rate of conversion. That's what we want to know. How quickly are we consuming our reactants? How quickly are we consuming our reactants? How quickly are we generating our products? So that's what we're interested in understanding. So we have, first of all, a simple thing. We have conservation of mass operating, which we've seen from early part of 3091, that the rate of consumption, the rate of consumption of all of the reactants, the rate of consumption of all of the reactants must equal the rate of production of all of the products. There's no sources or sinks. We have no wormholes here. Everything that goes into the plant has to come out of the plant in some other way. And, and specifically, we can even get into looking at the rate of disappearance of a single reactant. So, for example, the stoichiometry would dictate that the rate at which I consume A, this is 1 over A, this is the, the pre-multiplier, times the change in the concentration. I apologize for the multiple fonts here. This case, little c represents the stoichiometry. In this case, this represents concentration of A. The rate of change of concentration of A, the rate of its disappearance, when it's normalized for mole number, would be the same as the rate of appearance of D. So d by dt of the concentration of d. So we have these individual uh, relationships. So this is simply conservation, conservation of, of mass. Conservation of mass. So we have that. And now comes the interesting point of kinetic theory. What kinetic theory says is that there's a relationship between the instant rate of consumption of a product and its concentration. In other words, we essentially say that concentration, concentration of a reactant is the driving force, is the driving force for reaction. So let's say in terms of a word equation, the rate of change, the rate of change of concentration of any species, this is the concentration of some species I, rate of change of concentration is proportional to the instant concentration. And that makes sense. If you have a lot of a substance, it's going to have a high chemical potential to react. If you have a dilute concentration of the substance, it will have a, a weak uh, propensity to react. But it's not a linear relationship. It's some power-based relationship. So we have to say raised to some power. Raised to some power. So that conceptually, that's what's going on. And now we can write this in mathematical formulation. So let's say we're looking at the rate of consumption. So that's d by dt of some concentration of species i. I'm going to say it's proportional to the concentration of species i. It's raised to some power, and this n is now the order of reaction, the order of reaction. You've seen n used so many times in 3091. It was, it was a, a quantum number in the Bohr model. It was an index of refraction. It was in the Born repulsion. And today it's functioning as the order of reaction. So n is really a, you know, varied. It's a really talented uh, variable, very talented variable. It's not typecast in a simple role. That's what I'm saying. And now, the, how do I take a proportionality and turn it into an equality? I put in a constant of proportionality, a constant of proportionality. And that constant of proportionality is called the specific chemical rate constant, the specific chemical rate constant. And these have to be determined by experiment. You can't look at the. Uh, stoichiometry of a reaction and infer what the order of reaction is. 
These must be determined by experiment. Must be determined by experiment. So let's look at that first uh, equation and write it in its most general form. So what we could say is that the rate of change of concentration of species A goes as some constant times the concentration of species A to some arbitrary power alpha, but it may be influenced by some other concentration. So to be most general, we say concentration of species B raised to some power times the concentration of species C raised to some power. You might say, well, how can the concentration of species C have any influence on the rate of consumption of species A. Well, what if species C acts in some way as an inhibitor to the reaction? So as the concentration of product goes up, it could actually choke off the reaction. So to be general, we will put all four in here. And we will call these alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are all partial, partial orders of reaction. Partial orders of reaction to be determined experimentally. And they don't, by the way, they do not have to be integers. They're not necessarily integer. You can have something that's half order or third order reaction. Not necessarily integer values. So let's look at one. Here's a simple reaction. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, toxic. This is carbon monoxide plus chlorine will react to generate phosgene. COCl2 is phosgene. I've worked with this stuff in my research. It's actually, it has a, a fantastic ability to uh, uh, desiccate material. So if you have a solid that has a, a parts per million residual water, if you expose it to phosgene, uh, phosgene will attack the water, generating carbon dioxide and HCl. So it's very good. Unfortunately, it was also used as uh, uh, in gas warfare during World War I. It's now banned by international treaty. So, uh, on the basis of uh, experimental uh, evidence, we know that the rate of consumption of carbon monoxide in this reaction is related to the concentration of carbon monoxide linearly and the concentration of chlorine to the power of three halves based on experiment. So we would say that this reaction is first order first order in carbon monoxide because there's a linear relationship between the rate of consumption of carbon monoxide and the concentration, right? This is C to the power 1, but we don't write the 1. It's of order 1.5 order, of order 1.5 in chlorine, or we could say wholly or entirely of order 2.5, of order 2.5. So that gives you a sense of how the rate of disappearance of one uh, constituent can depend on not just its own concentration but other concentrations. So clearly if we're trying to build a plant to make phosgene we now have a quantitative measure of how to improve the rate of throughput. So suppo suppose somebody says well we'd like to build a plant that produces so many tons per year well you know what your limitations are in terms of concentration so you can figure out what you'd have to do in a quantitative, predictive manner. Well, there's another way we can improve the yield. What's another way to improve yield in a reaction? We can, instead of increasing concentration, we can increase temperature. We know that materials tend to react more quickly with one another at elevated temperature. Well, where's the elevated temperature going to fit into this equation? I don't see any temperature term. Temperature must be buried in the rate constant. And that's where we're going to go. We're going to look inside the rate constant. So we'll increase yield by increasing temperature. And that was known for many, many years. But it was finally the Swedish chemist Arrhenius, who in 1889 announced the relationship that bears his name. What he found was that the relationship between the specific rate constant and temperature was exponential through an equation of this form, exponential of the ratio of some energy, which he termed the activation energy, divided by the product of the 
Boltzmann constant and temperature, and a pre-exponential factor, which we write as A, in honor of Arrhenius. Or another way, if you can write it in this manner, A e to the minus Ea over K Boltzmann T. So there's the relationship. And another way of showing it is to put it on a semi-log plot. If you plot the natural logarithm of the rate constant as a function of the reciprocal of the absolute temperature, you'll find that, according to this equation, you should get a straight line. So 1 over t is increasing from left to right, so high temperature is on the left side. And this should be linear with a slope of minus Ea, which is the activation energy, divided by the Boltzmann constant. And just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, the activation energy for uh, typical chemical reactions is on the order of about 1 electron volt, which is on the order of about 100 kilojoules per mole. So if you take this and choose an arbitrary rate for room temperature, plug in the value of 100 kilojoules per mole, what you can show yourself is that with this uh, activation energy, you double, double the rate double the rate for every 10 degrees rise above room temperature. Obviously, this breaks down for large uh, excursions in temperature. But in the vicinity of room temperature, if uh, you have an activation energy of typically of about a 1 electron volt, you can expect to double for every 10 degree. So what's the physical meaning of activation energy? Well, I thought I'd try to show it to you in terms of a mechanical analog. So what I'm going to do here is show you um, what we can say is going to be, say, a loudspeaker. Okay? So loudspeaker, and what I've done by putting the X on the loudspeaker at the uh, intersection of the X, we'll say that that's the center of mass of the loudspeaker. So loudspeaker is now in a gravitational field, and we can argue that I could represent this as a point of zero dimension at this height off the table. Now, clearly, if I lie this on its side, the point has fallen. So it's now at a lower gravitational potential. So really, if the box had its way, the box would prefer to lie on its side. So how come the box doesn't just fall on its side? Why doesn't the box just lie on its side? See, it's a decrease in energy when I do that. Did you see the photon? When I, whoa, it's absorbed. Now, look at it go, see? OK, so why doesn't the box fall on its side? Well, this is a box at zero Kelvin. So now let's put the box at room temperature. So what's happening at room temperature? Well, the box is doing this at room temperature. But even so, the box won't fall on its side. Why? Because in order for the box in three space to go from the vertical upright locked position to the supine position, what must the box do? The box must first rise up on one corner. And only when it rises up on one corner and gets to this cusp does it have the ability to fall freely? So what we're looking at in terms of gravitational potential is activation. So I can now give you the same thing. I could plot this as extent of reaction, extent of reaction on the uh, abscissa and some energy relative to gravitational potential on the ordinate. And I've got three positions here. I've got the box in the vertical position. I've got the box in the horizontal position, and clearly, there's a decrease in energy, right? This, this change is the delta E of the reaction, but the box can't get to the right position from the left position without first rising up on its side. It must, at some point, rise up on its side. And when it rises up on its side, its center of mass has risen, and this energy is the activation energy. So. That's the, that's the uh, mechanical analog. The delta E reaction, this is the driving force for the reaction in the first place. The driving force for the reaction. And Ea, in fact, is the gatekeeper. It's the gatekeeper. It determines the rate of reaction. Because on the basis of Ea, Ea mediates the rate constant. So all other things being equal, temperature gives you the rate constant through Ea. And now we'll recall the other temperature effect. You say, well, gee, how does, 
how does any of this stuff happen if, if room temperature, you know that room temperature uh, energy is typically on the order of about a 40th of an electron volt, and I just told you that chemical reactions have activation energies on the order of one electron volt. According to that, we'd have to be up at thousands of degrees centigrade in order to, to promote any chemical reactions. How do we get chemical reactions at 200, 300 degrees centigrade? What we have going on is the distribution of energies. Distribution of energies. And I will go back to that plot that we saw earlier. Here's T1. Here's the average energy at T1. And out here is one electron volt, or whatever it happens to be, the activation energy. And so only the fraction of the population that has greater than the activation energy is able to participate in the reaction. And we've seen before the measure of the area under this curve from Ea out to infinity is given by the relationship Ea k Boltzmann t exponential of which. And so th it was Boltzmann who first gave us this uh, understanding, and then Maxwell gave us the distribution, and away we go. So what happens by changing temperature, we've seen before, when we change temperature, the curve moves ever so slightly so that the average energy at T2, where T2 is greater than T1, the average energy moves a little bit, but what happens up here is the area under the curve between Ea and infinity goes up by large leaps and bounds, and that's how, by modest increases in temperature, we're able to get substantial increases in the rate of reaction. So now let's look at some specific uh, reactions of various common order. So I'm going to look at first order, which is the commonest, and I'm going to look at second order. So let's look at first order reactions. First order reactions. So here's an example. Example is N2O5 decomposes to give us NO2 plus O2. So there's the stoichiometry of the reaction, but on the basis of, uh, on the basis of measurements in the laboratory, we can write that the rate of consumption of N2O5, so this, the square brackets denote concentration, the, it's found to be linear in concentration of N2O5 or N2O5 raised to the first power. So this, we say, is a first order reaction. And I'm getting tired of writing N2O5 bracket bracket. So I'm just going to write C. C represents all of this. I'm compressing the font. So I'm going to rewrite this equation as minus dC by dt equals kc. So that's a first order reaction. Why? Because this is a 1. That's why it's first order. It's linearly dependent. The rate of change of C is linearly dependent on concentration. So I do a little bit of calculus here. If I, I can invert this, and I can then write uh, minus, minus dC over C equals K dT. And what we're going to do is we're going to integrate this thing out so that we can get the timeline on this. And so uh, I can put an integration sign here. K is independent, so we can do that. And I'm going to start at time zero, where I have some initial concentration, and go to some arbitrary concentration C and arbitrary time T. So I want, what I want to look at is this. If I plot, this is some initial concentration versus time. We know all of these things are going to attenuate. I want to know what this curve really, really looks like. And I know some of you are sitting there wincing, saying, because your math professors have told you you can't make the limits of an integral the same as the uh, value of the integrand, so I don't want to go to math jail. So we'll put little tildes over this so that all the math weenies are happy here, you see? All right? But, you know, what we could do, what I could do to really make it pedantic is let's not do that. Let's, let's uh, use a carrier variable. So I'll make this S, which now you don't know what I'm talking about, and I'll make this C. And that's mathematically beautiful. It doesn't explain what we're talking about. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to put the C and a little tilde over it. So everybody now is happy. So there we go. This is T with a little tilde. And if we integrate this thing out, what do we get? We get that the natural log of C goes as the natural log of the initial concentration C naught minus KT. So what I'm, what I'm talking about is 
the, the way that I can determine what, what the order of reaction is is to look at the functional shape of this. In other words, all of the, whether it's first order, second order, or 2.5 order, they all look like this, the curves. So what I really need to do is, is what, the, what the eye is capable of doing is detecting something simple like a straight line. So if I'm clever about it, if I take instead of C versus T, if instead I, I map this into functional, so I map C into some function of C, and I map T into some function of T that is embedded in the physical chemistry of the process so that f of c should be a linear function of g of t, whether it's this or whether it's this, then I can inspect and I can say, that looks linear. Therefore, the assumptions that underlie those functionals must be what's going on. And that's the way we determine order of reaction. So, uh, one other reaction I want to give you, even though it's not chemistry, I, I still want you to understand this falls under the rubric of general culture. Radioactive decay obeys first order kinetics. So, let's just... Let's just take note of that. Radioactive decay is first order. So, for example, uh, here's a reaction. U-238 can decompose to give thorium-234 plus helium. And if we plot, if we plot concentration of uranium as a function of time, starting with some initial value, C naught, we'll just have this attenuation. But if we map it into the natural log of C versus time, we'll get a straight line, and the slope here will give us minus K. And we know that this is N equals 1, because if you see a plot of log of natural log of concentration as a function of temperature, if it's a straight line, Bingo, that tells you that this must be first order and the slope of that line is minus k. Now, it turns out that people that work in a radioactive decay don't like to uh, express the rate of reaction in terms of the rate constant. They prefer to use a different quantity called the half-life. The half-life. The half-life is a little more practical. It has, uh, it's more directly uh, obvious what, what it's related to. And so the half-life is basically what you get if you take this equation here and plug in C naught over 2. It's the time it takes to consume half of the reagent that's present. So if I start with C naught and I plug in C naught over 2 and solve for time, that's going to give me the half-life. And if you do that, you'll end up with T to the 1 half is equal to the natural log of 2, which is 0.693 over k. So the, the half-life is inversely proportional to the rate constant and mediated by the natural log of 2. And it turns out for this reaction, the half-life, T1 half for this reaction, is 4.5 billion years. 4.5 billion years. So if you spill this into uh, the sandbox at the neighborhood park, it's going to be a while before you can go back there and play. It'll take you four and a half billion years just to get the concentration down to half of what it is. And then uh, nine billion years will get it down to a quarter, et cetera, et cetera. And the nice thing about half-life, and the only time I would ever ask you to calculate half-life, is in connection with first-order reactions. Because only for first-order reactions is half-life independent of concentration. For every other order of reaction, the half-life is a function of concentration, in which case it's a useless quantity, except to perhaps uh, professors of chemistry. So we will not ask you for this except t in the case of first order. T one half independent of concentration for n equals one. You can prove to yourself for higher order how the half-life varies with concentration. So I said that we'd look at the other, which is second order. Second order reactions. And uh, here's an example. It's dimerization of aluminum trichloride. Aluminum trichloride can form the dimer Al2Cl6. This is gas phase. And right off the bat, I'm going to let C be the concentration of aluminum trichloride. And it's second order because the rate of disappearance of aluminum trichloride goes as the square. Now, this is one of those instances where it's really tempting because this reaction has a 2 in front of it. And it turns out that 
the rate of disappearance of aluminum trichloride goes as Kc squared. But do not, do not, I'm going to say three times, do not assume that this is the rule, that because you saw it once, that this is always the case, that the stoichiometry gives you the order of reaction. This is not the general case. It happens in this reaction for reasons that uh, we'll go into later, but generally you have to measure the order of reaction. And so if we go through the same analysis, we'll have minus dc over c squared equals kdt. We'll do the integration, blah, 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 and eventually we end up with this relationship. The reciprocal of concentration is a linear function of time. So that means that the functional that we need is given here. So well, the, the way to determine if something is, is first order, excuse me, second order or not, is to take this ordinary timeline, concentration versus time, which is always going to look like this to the naked eye. You're going to say, I don't know if that's first order or second order, but I can detect a straight line. So if instead I map this into 1 over C versus time, I should end up with a straight line starting at 1 over C naught, and the slope of that line should be k. So when I see that this is a straight line, I go n equals 2, and the slope is the rate constant. If this were not second order, I wouldn't get a straight line. So this, uh, this allows me to, to proceed and get the order of reaction. And in fact, what I'm showing you is one of the ways people uh, determine order of reaction. They use the integrated form of the rate equation, and so this is called the integral method to determine order of reaction. Determination of order of reaction. Order of reaction. The first way is integral method. Integral method, and it's essentially a, a comparison it's so a comparison with the integrated form of the rate law. Comparison with integrated form of the rate law. Integrated rate law equation. So this is really inspection. This is trial and error. But we don't say trial and error because you're from MIT, so we use fancier words. We say by inspection. That's how you tell a boss you don't know what you're doing. Uh, just you really have to do this by inspection, sir. So I say, okay. So what I do is I try n equals 1. If I get an arbitrary data set, I try n equals 1. I try n equals 2. After that, I say, forget it, and I'm going to go to the other method. So let me show you a couple of slides that indicate this. Uh, so here's a data set. I, pu I pulled this out of some book. This is a reaction. So this is time. This is the concentration of some species. Um, and don't worry about that. We'll get to that in a second. So here's your data set. This is all you have. And if you plot these, here's what they look like. So this is concentration in uh, moles per uh, unit volume as a function of time. And there's a C naught normalized to one unit, and it's attenuating. So over 500 seconds, we're down to about 20% of the initial value. So I say, what's the order of reaction? Well, I can't tell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, now let's take natural log of C versus time. Bingo, straight line. So that, for, on this basis, I conclude that it's a straight line, and the slope of this line is the rate constant. But just to show you that it doesn't always work, I said just for grins and chuckles, plot that same data set as 1 over c. And look what happens. When I plot it as 1 over c, I don't get a straight line. So it really does discriminate. It doesn't give me uh, what I was going to uh, expect in terms of a straight line, except when I have the proper order of reaction. So now let's see another way that we can get at this, and this is called the differential method. We're not going to use the uh, integrated form of the rate equation. We'll use the, the differential form. And uh, I'm going to, to compress the notation, I'm going to let lowercase r be the rate. The rate is lowercase r, which I'm going to uh, let stand for minus dc by dt. See how I get my fonts more and more compressed? I start with the big, with the square brackets, and then I get to this, and now I get to this. It's getting tighter and tighter. OK, so now I can write the rate equation as the rate goes as kc to the n. So there's the arbitrary rate equation. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the logarithm 
of the equation. So I'm, I can map that into the logarithm of the rate. The, uh, the log of a product is the sum of the logs, so that'll be the logarithm of the rate constant plus n times the logarithm of concentration. And now what I can do is start with concentration as a function of time. We know it starts at some value c naught and attenuates. So now I'm going to plot the slope, the rate of consumption, not as a function of time, but as a function of concentration. So here's the initial concentration. If I take the slope, this is going to represent uh, the slope r naught, which is equal to um, minus dc by dt at time t naught when concentration equals c naught. So I'm going to end up with a data pair r naught and c naught. And ultimately, here's what I want to do. I might want to make this plot of log of the rate versus log of the concentration. So I've got my first data pair, r naught, c naught, can go over here. Bingo. And then some arbitrary time later, here's, here's t naught, here's t1. At t1, I take the slope. So this is now slope r1, which is minus dc by dt at t1. And now the concentration is equal to some new value, c1. So this was c0, this is c1. So now I'm taking the data pairs r1, c1. So I take that, and they go over here. And let's do one more, because I'm having so much fun. This is t2, and here's c2. The concentration has dropped to c2. I take the slope, slope r2, blah, 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 c2. And so I take that, and I'll put it over here. And I'm going to end up with a straight line. If you don't get a straight line on a log-log plot, you're an idiot. You know? You're working with chemical systems. I mean, log-log linearizes everything, OK? So what do I have here? I got a straight line, log r versus log c. The slope is n. The slope is n, the order of reaction. And what's this intercept? Value of the intercept is log k. Superb, superb. So I did that with the same data set. So what I did is I went back, uh, and here's the rate. I took the rates by taking the deltas. The, the delta C over delta T. So I went down the curve, differentiated. Those are my rates. And now here's log R versus log C. Straight line, and it has a slope of 1. So slope of 1, in fact, the least squares gives me 1.018. It allows for a little bit of uh, uh, variation in experimental measurement, and it gives me a straight line. So this is the differential method for um, determining the rate of reaction. Well, I said we can increase, we can increase the, uh, productivity by increasing concentration. We're going to increase productivity by increasing temperature. But there's another way we can increase productivity, another way. And the way we can do that is by modifying the value of k. I've shown you how to do it by playing with temperature. There's another way to modify the value of k modify the value of activation energy. And we do that by the use of a catalyst. So increase rate via catalyst. And what the catalyst does, the catalyst decreases, decreases the activation energy for reaction. And by decreasing the activation energy, all other things being equal, same concentration, same temperature, so therefore that means it increases K at given temperature, at given temperature. So the way we can view the catalyst as working is the following. If I plot this energy versus extent of reaction, and we, we see we start with some, this is the reactance at some energy arbitrarily denoted as shown. And the products have to be at a lower energy. If the products are not at a lower energy than the reactants, there's no driving force for uh, the reaction in the first place. But we know we have to go up to some activated state in order to get 
up to the corner of the box, so to speak. So here we are. This is the energy state of the reactants. This is the energy state of the products. But we have to invest this amount of energy in order to allow for the, the throughput. So this is activation energy. What a catalyst does is it reduces the level of activation needed by assisting with some kind of a uh, physical process such as adsorbing gas molecules so that they can find each other more readily and react. So this is catalyzed. This is Ea and now this one here, this is Ea catalyzed. The catalyst, catalyst reduces the activation energy. And the result is, if we go over to this curve, Ne versus E, we still have the same temperature distribution. We haven't changed that. So if this is the activation energy as stated for the reaction in the presence of the catalyst. The catalyst reduces the activation energy, Ea catalyzed. So therefore, the area under the curve is much, much greater under the influence of catalysis. All right? And while we're in the neighborhood, there are other uh, actors that can increase the activation energy. So that's up here, and this is Ea under the influence of an inhibitor. Inhibitor. And sometimes we want inhibitors. What's an inhibitor? Inhibitor is going to raise the activation energy. Now the area under the curve is even smaller. Inhibited. So for example, a catalyst we want in order to improve productivity such as conversion of, of pollutants in automotive exhaust. We want to increase the productivity. But an inhibitor we want to put in to slow down an undesirable reaction, such as to reduce the rate of corrosion in your uh, coolant. Flo flows through the radiator and engine block. There are chemicals that are added to inhibit the corrosion processes, which are undesirable for the long-term maintenance of the automobile. So we see how... There's a relationship between the catalysis, inhibition, and the uh, energy available to drive a reaction. So let's see what we have up here for five minutes today. Oh, radiocarbon dating. This is from uh, Willard Libby, who got the Nobel Prize in 1960. Um, in the upper atmosphere, under the influence of cosmic rays, uh, neutrons are generated. And the neutrons react with nitrogen to form carbon-14. And we, we know that carbon-14 is present in about one part per trillion. So this is now part of the carbon cycle down here. So all the carbon atoms and all living things, because we're constantly exchanging carbon with our surroundings, take any carbon atom out of any one of us, and we'll have dominantly carbon-12, about 1% carbon-13, and one part per trillion carbon-14. But when we die, we stop exchanging with the surroundings. In fact, if you're looking for a new euphemism for death, instead of saying he passed away, you could say he exited the carbon cycle. He's no longer playing, all right? So upon death, we stop exchanging. So we start at one part per trillion when we die, and then this reaction takes place. The carbon-14 decays radioactively to nitrogen plus uh, beta. It's a beta decay. And so if we measure the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, knowing the half-life is 5,730 years, we can figure out how long it's been since we checked out of the carbon cycle. So these are some things that have been carbon dated. There's some uh, things that have been looked at over time. I mean, one of the assumptions is that the rate of neutron generation and carbon-14 generation hasn't changed over, say, the last 10, 15,000 years, which is really a blink of an eye by cosmic measurements. So here are some things that have been dated. There's the Dead Sea Scrolls came in at about 1917 years back from today, but with uncertainties. It's about plus or minus 200. This uh, Mount Mazama that uh, erupted in Oregon and, and uh, made Crater Lake uh, uh, quenched some uh, trees, and the charcoal from those trees comes in at 6453 from today. And the charcoal from the cave paintings in Lascaux in France uh, dates back 15,516 years. So that's, that's the kind of stuff that you see. Here's one that's uh, quite controversial, so we're not strangers to controversy. This is the Shroud of Turin. This is a painting showing what is to be uh, the burial shroud of Christ, and this shows the uh, two images that it's supposed to have. See, this is how the shroud would have been. It's a linen piece about 14 feet long, 
This is from a National Geographic article about six, seven years ago showing various features on the shroud. And here's, this is the shroud and this is the painting, just to give you a sense of what is supposed to be there. And so uh, oh, in the mid-80s, uh, fragments of that shroud were sent to three different laboratories in three different countries, and it was dated to, uh, the fabric was dated to come from this interval of about 1260 to 1390. This shows the cartoon of the uh, cosmic rays generating carbon-14, which goes into flax. Once we pick the, pick the flax, make linen, it's out of the carbon cycle, and these are going out like twink lights, and then you can calculate the various things. This is very hotly contested. Some people are, are ardent believers, and they believe that uh, the data that were gathered are false because there was a fire in 1532, and here's a painting showing people repairing the shroud using candles, and there's uh, arguments that there's paraffin from the candles that's coating the outer surface of the filaments. In fact, you're analyzing the carbon from the paraffin that was absorbed on the filament. So it's all about sampling, you know? all about sampling. Very interesting. If you get on the Internet, you'll find all kinds of stuff on there about this. So here's a question, you know, how do you do the, how do you do the test? You know the way to do it properly? Is to take the whole thing? put it in a giant blender, so you're not looking at surface effects, right? So th this, is the, this is the problem, how to do non-destructive evaluation of an artifact. I'll see you on Friday.